Our scripture today comes from the letter of James, and we're beginning at verse 9 and reading through verse 18 of chapter 1, continuing a series of verses that deal with trials. Now, after today, James is going to switch tact and get into some other subjects, but uh, today we're still on the issue of rules for facing trials. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, because the one who, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. These first 18 verses in James deal with trial, and we've attempted to give several rules for facing trial as a summary of each message. The first rule we said of trial, rule number one, say welcome. Count it all joy when you face trials of many colors. Rule number two, say help. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives liberally and doesn't chew you out. Modern wood translation. Rule number three for trials, say better. I am going to emerge from this because of God's help better and stronger. I will be a richer person, a healthier person, a more vibrant person after I have gone through the trial than when I was when I entered it. Say better. When I visit a person in the hospital, I know better than to do this, but invariably I say to them as a greeting, well, how are you today? Now it's obvious that they have every right to come back to me and say, Pastor, if we were doing fine, we wouldn't be in the hospital. Stupid. <laughs> but I'm saying, how are you? Hoping to hear them say back to me, which they inevitably do, better, even if they're worse. Better. It's a word we like to hear, better. I think when that one word better came most vividly to me in all my life was just nine months ago when at the top of Masada in Israel I became aware that our minister to prime timers Bob Sistig was having some problems it turned out later of course that he was having a fatal heart attack we got him on a litter and two guys carried him down the 80 steps from the top of Masada to the ledge where the tram can be caught to travel the additional 2,000 feet down to the Dead Sea get him to a hospital. And as the tram cleared out of people that were coming up on the ascent, there was just going to be Bob and Genevieve and I and the two guys who were the uh, CPR people that were up there. They were going to put him onto the floor of the cable car. And he was lying there on that stone concrete ledge. And I was concerned, of course, for him. And I bent over very close to him, just inches away from his face. And I said to him very quietly, how are you now, Bob? And he looked up at me and smiled and said, better. And he had no sooner said better than instantly he was gone. And in spite of heroic attempts to revive him, which stretched over the next two hours, he never came back. I have wondered if in that moment which he said better to me and the smile came on his face, if he meant something other than I'm feeling better because the oxygen they're giving me is helping me, I wonder if in that split millisecond of time he didn't get a look into the parted heavens and have a feeling and only one moment of life was left to him and only one word could be said, better. James is reminding us 
And when it's all said and done, it will be better if our faith is in him. That is a bottom line of life, better. And uh, there are some reasons in this passage as we have read today that James advances to motivate us to say better. Three things he tells us to encourage us to say better in life. First thing that he does for us is he reminds us in verses 9 through 12 to look at how we are going to end up as Christians. How is it all going to end? And he says, if you will look at the end and see what's out there down the road ahead of you, you'll be able to say of life better. Now he begins this section by making a contrast between the poor brother in humble circumstances and the person who is rich. And we do, I think, this uh, verse injustice if we think that James is talking about money, about the money poor and the money rich. Since James is the younger earthly brother of Jesus, he is, of course, familiar with what Jesus taught in his teaching. And in Luke chapter 6, the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus himself makes a clear distinction as to what he means by richness and poorness, where he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, but woe to those who are rich. Blessed are those, he says, who mourn. Woe to those who laugh. What he is talking about are persons who are spiritually poor, that is, who place themselves in a position of complete dependence upon God and say, I have absolutely nothing with which to become a child of God or have eternal life. I stake my stand before God as a pauper. In contrast to those who say, I've got it all together now and I have everything I need and I don't need God's help. James is saying that trial may bring us to a position of poverty, and it may be more than financial poverty. Maybe the trial is such that we're looking at ourselves as have-nots and other people as haves. Maybe it is a financial trial. We have not, and we look at the person who has. Or maybe it's a health trial, and we don't have health, and we're sick, and the other person has health, whether they're a Christian or non-Christian. Or maybe you're single and want to be married, and you look at a happily married couple and say, well, they're the haves and I'm the have-nots. Or maybe you're married and not happy, and you look at a single who appears to be happy, and you're the, the uh, have-not, and they're the haves. And maybe it's a, a matter that you're a couple and you don't have a child and you want a child and you say, boy, look at that couple over there, they have children and they're the, they're the haves and you're the have not. Well, all these situations speak of going through difficult circumstances and it so often appears when we're going through trials and we're the poor person in the trial that other people are sleek and fat and untroubled and we can become envious. But in these adversities of life, what is to be our attitude? We're to, again, look at the end. And so James says, the brother in humble circumstances should take pride in his high position. That is to say, in going through trial, instead of simply focusing upon all the things that are going wrong and all the have-nots, we're to look at the things we have. We're to look at our high position. And the high position is that we have been made a son or a daughter of God. We've been made an heir of Christ Jesus. We've been given a name and we've been declared God's own and we have a everlasting life prepared for us and we have life in the present. We have. And all that's very real. You know, sometimes we let our religious faith be guided too much by our feelings. We were having a conversation this week, uh, some of us, about worship services and Jerry Kirk was noting that some of us who are behind the microphone from time to time fall victim to a false prayer and will say, Oh, Lord, help the congregation today to feel your presence in the worship service. As though that in praying that God wouldn't be present if we didn't feel it. But God is present not because we ask him to help us to feel his presence. God is present because he said in his word, Whenever two or three of you gather together in my name, I am in the midst. So it isn't my feelings that create his presence. It's the reality of his word that creates his presence. This is essentially what James is saying when we're in trial. If you're down and out and bad, you know, run down on your luck, instead of just concentrating on all the things that are going wrong, take pride in your high position. You're born again. You're called to be a son or a daughter of God. He's blessed you with many blessings in life. And on the other hand, if you've got it all together and you're saying, wow, everything is just hunky-dory in my life and I don't need a thing, then you're not to concentrate on your high position, but you're instead to rejoice in your low position. What is your low position? To remember 
that from which Jesus Christ has saved you and brought you up out of. So let him who is down rejoice and boast, and let him who is up think of how God has brought him or her from the depths. Someone has said that we are to remember that when we die and are without Christ, we will leave our riches. But if we are in Christ, when we die, we're only going to our riches. Consider the end, James says. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. When he has stood the test. Blessed. This summer, when I was in England, Jewel and I were uh, on this tour, and we uh, stopped at Winston Churchill's burial place, which is in a small village that he loved near his home in the town of Bladen, England. He is buried in a rural country churchyard. And a beautiful white stone on his grave, very simple. And I don't know, I probably have some... Uh, rough spots or uh, crazy spots in my personality, but I find myself enjoying uh, cemeteries uh, that are old because I like to read all the inscriptions. I figure that it helps me get a grasp on life. And so not only did I want to see what was on Winston Churchill's grave, but I wanted to read the other graves there, which were some of them centuries old. And as I walked past Churchill's grave and went towards St. Martin's Church, which is the church on the grounds, beautiful old Anglican church, I came across an old tombstone, and I got out my notebook and copied this down. So I guess I'm still searching for the perfect epitaph for me, see, and I'm getting, <laughs> collecting ideas as the years go along. And here, here's what it said, and I wish you could read this out of the text I have because I copied it down as it was spelled in the Old English, and the Old English spellings are so quaint, but when you enunciate them, they sound modern. But it said this, Here lieth the body of William Hopkins, gent, who deceased April 27th, Anno Domino, 1682. And then the poem. Ren reader, upon me cast thine eye. As thou art here now, so was I. <laughs> but death of me a debt did claim. I paid it, thou must do the same. <laughs> I thought, you booger, you're still speaking to me from the grave. You're trying to talk to me, aren't you? I thought, wow, that's so true. I think it was Carl Barth that said, someday a company of men will go out to a church yard and one will not come back and that will be me. James is saying, if life is going along and you're going through trial, just remember that at the end of the road, you stand in Christ. Ahead of you is the crown of life. Isn't it interesting, and I just point this out in passing, but isn't it interesting that there may be some trials in life that never have a this world resolution? That is, we may never in the physical bodies that we have get out of the trial or we may never know why it was or what was going on in it. But we may have to wait until we've got the crown of life. My spirit based upon my reading of the Word of God, protests so much to what I even see on Christian television with ministers promising the body of Christ that somehow you can get everything worked out now and if you just exercise the right formula or the right language in prayer or get the right code words, you're going to turn out sleek and healthy and wealthy and everything. When he has stood the test, receives the crown of life. You know, the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk had a marvelous experience in this. God told him that he would not live long enough to see God straighten up the mess that his country was in. And that for a period of time, even in his lifetime, it would look like God was doing the wrong thing and wasn't acting to correct the injustice. But he said to Hab Habakkuk, the prophet, don't worry about that. I will, in my time, straighten it all up. But you may die before that happens. And he says to Habakkuk, in the meantime, the righteous live by faith. That is to say, you must have faith in my essential goodness. As you go through times of perplexity, know that I will, in my time, have it all straight. 
So this is what James is telling us. When we stood the trial, the crown of life, and the crown of life, wow, the crown was, is, is the word Stephanos, from which we derive the English word Stephen. It meant a laurel wreath. It's not like the crown, the tiara, which the uh, Queen of England uh, wears, which you can go into the tower and see all the crown jewels and stuff like that. This is just the, the laurel wreath that a bride wore on a wedding day or that a runner in the Olympic Games or other great games, uh, uh, who, when he uh, won the race, they'd give him the laurel wreath, the crown or a public uh, person was being honored at a banquet in his, in his honor. He was given the crown to show that he, he wore honor and dignity. Or maybe even when a visiting royalty came, he might have that placed upon his head to show royalty. So uh, the Lord is telling us in his word that in that day, we're all going to have that aspect to our personalities, which brings out and illustrates all the festive joy, all the victory, all the honor and dignity, and uh, all the royalty that is really flowing through us. Crown of life. So it's going to be better as you look at how it down the road is all going to end. Second to motivation that James gives us for saying the word better is that we are to look at where a flight from responsibility will lead us. See, if we become irresponsible as we face our trials, things will not be better. So he is saying to us, now in your trial, don't begin thinking and acting irresponsibly and wrongfully and sinfully, James recognizes that the trial can become a temptation. In fact, very interesting, the word temptation that is used in verse 13 is the same word in the Greek that is used and translated as trial back to verse 2. Now, in the English, we have the two different words, trial and temptation. Temptation has a more sinister sense to it. Trial is somewhat morally neutral. And there are some who look at James 1.13 no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone and say, oh boy, does the scripture here have an inherent contradiction? Because back in Genesis 22, 1, it says, and the Lord God did tempt or test Abraham. So how can James say God doesn't tempt people when he did test Abraham? The difference has to do with what this word test involved. Whenever the word, the verb for testing is used of God, it always has the connotation to it of the test is one from which you will emerge successfully. As you look at any passage in the Bible where it says God tested somebody, the, the, the conclusion that is reached is that person stood the test. And, and their metal, their true metal of faith was proven like Abraham. But there is also an evil force, both external, the devil, and internal, our evil desires that pull us in that test down. God is never using the test to pull us down. He's not sending the test. He's not the author of the test that will pull us down into evil. He is instead seeking to give us his help to overcome the test and to be strong. Therefore, we are not to blame God in our trial. And also, I might add that probably it would be a good idea at times not to blame the devil. Flip Wilson immortalized the phrase, the devil made me do it. I think it was Geraldine, right? One of his characters that did the devil made me do it. But James here doesn't even blame the devil. He says uh, the blame lies within. Our own evil desires, not our environment, not our family, not the devil, not society. Our own evil desires, our thought life in trial can become warped and twisted. And if it becomes warped and twisted and irresponsible, it will produce actions that give birth to death. Sin, when it's conceived, brings forth death. And when a child is conceived and is brought forth, it is living. Here's an analogy that really reverses that and says that when you are in a gestation time of the conception of sin, when it is delivered, that is, when the thought, the attitude, is carried through to its conclusion, that is, an action, when the thought is born, acted out, it results in death. So, here is the only biblical example I know of that makes a case for abortion. If you have ideas that are unlike God and you have attitudes that are wrong, while they are attempting to gestate and conceive in you, abort them so that they are not given birth in the form of wrong actions. If they give 
If they come forth into, into life, those sinful actions will wind up destroying us, proving to be death. I have observed sometimes in the body of Christ that our temptations are not always sexual. Many times they're on a spiritual level and they have to do with attitudes toward others in the body of Christ. In my course of years of being in the ministry, I have seen the productivity of servants of the Lord sometimes destroyed because they, persons, let wrong ideas get born in their life which produce bad actions. For example, what happens if you're faithfully serving the church or serving in the body of Christ and maybe you don't feel like people have been thanking you or noticing you or appreciating you or stroking you and that becomes a trial to you and you say well why should I do what I'm doing nobody ever seems to appreciate nobody notices it I will think I'll drop out for a few weeks and see if anybody calls me and then if nobody calls that's all the more hurtful and those attitudes we're letting germinate gestate in our life to finally it moves us completely not only away from the people of God but it moves us away from God himself instead of aborting those attitudes which are going to result in our destruction we let them grow when we need to kill them with a different kind of action which says return good for evil if you're not being noticed and not being said thank you to you know how to really correct that is to look at about three to five people that have blessed and touched your life and go tell them thanks for how they've helped you and if no one is calling you and saying I notice you I love you how to correct that attitude that begins to produce negativity in your heart is to reach out and get a hold of three or five people that you maybe haven't noticed and call them slay those things that are going to produce death in your life and make you unproductive to God that's what really James is saying don't take flight from responsibility for when desire is conceived it gives birth to sin and sin when it's full grown gives birth to death that's the end for us when evil is allowed to germinate in our life the third thing James is saying to us about the word better is look at what God is sending you in the trial look at what God is sending you not only look at the end not only look at what irresponsibility is going to cost you but look at what God is sending you in the trial every good don't be de deceived my dear friends every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of heavenly lights he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created what's what James is really saying is that in the midst of your trial God is sending you good and perfect gifts how is that I if I were to let my hand illustrate the uh, environment that we are let's say that you're in the center of the palm and it's sort of like into the end of your life there are the bombs dropping you know maybe it's uh, you've lost your job uh, maybe it's uh, uh, someone has abandoned you in a relationship or your uh, marriage is going through a divorce or a separation uh, maybe you've just got a word from a doctor that you're seriously ill. I don't know what the trial is. Those bombs are dropping in our life. And those are not good nor perfect gifts. That's, James is not saying, call everything that happens in your life good and perfect. Just use a different name for it. Confess it's okay. You know, I am not going to be a person who when the th hammer hits my thumb, when I accidentally strike the thumb instead of the nail, I'm not going to look up and say, Oh, thank you, Lord, for helping me miss the nail today and for the wonderful sensation that my thumb now feels. Every blow is a perfect gift from God. You know, James is not talking to us to play those kinds of idiot mental games. He is saying, however, that when these bombs are dropping on your life, God's also parachuting down some good and perfect gifts. And they're landing in the same field. And our problem is when we're going through the adversity is that sometimes all we see is the bombs and don't immediately spot the gifts that are coming down. But they are coming down. 
And as we persevere through the trial, we will see what special and wonderful things God is allowing inside of us and sometimes externally good things as well, not just internal, but external, things that are happening to us. And we are finding as we go through the trial that what God gives us as his good and perfect gift begins to dominate, make it possible to get through the trial because God is depositing his goodness and his perfection in us. And we are then becoming the cream of the crop. The first fruits is the Bible word for it. Maybe in our parlance we would say God is, God is making us the cream of the crop and is showing us to everybody. And he's saying, look at what my word is birthing in them. And he's setting us as a display to those who know him not of his goodness and his gifts. You say, Pastor, that's a hard thing for me to swallow. I understand that. It's hard for me at times to swallow because when I'm going through pain, all I want to do is hurt. And sometimes the last thing I want is the word of the Lord to come at me in a level that says, hey, look at the other side. A few weeks ago, I was in Africa with my cousin, John Weidman. John grew up in Africa. His parents were missionaries in French West Africa, serving in the countries of Ghana, Togo and Upper Volta, now called Burkina Faso. John was taking me on this tour. We had left Lomi, Togo, which is right on the coast, and headed north through the country of Togo. Now, Togo is a strangely shaped country. It's 50 miles wide at its widest point, but it's 500 miles long from north to south. And as you head north, you're heading up into the Sahara, if you went far north enough. You cross the border of Togo, and you come into Burkina Faso, and then you keep going several hundred more miles, and you're on the edge of the Sahara. We were driving through Togo, and we came into Burkina Faso, the town, a town in the southern part of Burkina Faso, below Ouagadougou, just so you'll know where that's at on your map. <laughs> and we came to the little town of Tengudugu. I love African names. Now, we got such non-euphonious sounding names like Costa Mesa and Fountain Valley and Tustin. And we could be living in places like Tengudugu and Ouagadougou and Wayagoya and Jibu. But anyway, such be it. <laughs> Tengudugu is kind of a wide spot in the road. I don't know, 15, 20,000 people, one paved street, and that's the main highway, two lane going through town. Everything else is dirt roads, mud huts, mud houses. With laced with straw, held together. Chickens, goats, animals running around the street, cows. It had been a rainy day as we had dr been driving into uh, Tengudugu. It was overcast and the, uh, it was rather cold for Africa, about 75 degrees. When we came to Tengudugu, John was going to show me something very special in his parents and family's life. And so we pulled off the main road as we entered into town and went down a dirt road, and within two blocks we were already out of town on this little dirt road. Since it had rained, the road was muddy, and we finally came to a place where we couldn't go any further, and so we had to stop and get out and walk about two blocks more to where we were going. Where we were going was the cemetery in Tengudugu. John went out ahead of me, and I followed after him, and we came in that cemetery to a little unmarked grave. It had a stone slab, maybe four feet by about two feet, unmarked. The grave is now 50 years old. But in the late 30s, the oldest son, a seven-year-old boy of missionaries Paul and Virginia Weidman, was laid to rest in that grave. They had come to Africa. They had two boys, Paul Jr. and John, my cousin, who was four at the time his brother, Paul Jr., died. He had contracted black water fever, and within a week, he was gone. John and I stood again at that site. It was a scene that will always have a special place in my own heart that speaks of a service of members of my family for God, which I don't come anywhere close to representing. I, as I looked around and could see Ten Gudugu just a block or two away and those dusty streets and like, I thought, boy, I would never give my son George Paul or my daughter Evangeline, I don't think I could risk them. What's there to reach in Tengudugu? 
mud and straw houses and chickens running around and cows in the street and lower socioeconomic kind of situation prevailing in the town and few people there. Wow. Gave his son to reach these people. Shortly after Paul Jr. died, his dad, Paul Sr., had felt the call to go south into Togo, just a few miles away, and establish a church in a town called Dapango. And so they headed south a few miles from Tengudugu down to Dapango. Built a mud house, moved into it, and the first heavy rainstorm that came, the mud roof collapsed in on them, right into their bedroom. They only had, I think, two rooms in the hut, collapsed right on them. Paul Sr. had a amoebic dysentery at the moment that the roof collapsed. He was running a temperature of 105 degrees, and for a year he had had a fever, practically ever since his son had died. Here he is. His son is buried in Burkina Faso and Tengudugu. He's down in Dapongo. He, at least he hadn't left the mission field. He hadn't become bitter. He says, oh, I'm here to serve God. He'd gone down there to Dapongo to start the church. Now he's had a fever for a year. He has amoebic dysentery. The roof collapses on him, and they have nowhere to go. They hide out until they can get dried out. Somebody went, went into somebody else's house. And then Aunt Virginia, since Paul was, Uncle Paul was so sick he couldn't drive, got him in the truck, and they drove back to Ouagadougou, several hundred miles north. Virginia was expecting their second child. They're actually the third, but second living child. And no sooner they got back to Ouagadougou when she began spotting and her pregnancy was in danger and the doctor told her to go to bed until the child was born. So for six weeks she lay in bed, not certain that she would give birth to this child. And then a week before the birth, they learned that France had fallen to the Germans and they were in French West Africa, which meant that now the government would change and their America was getting into war with Germany and here they were Americans in French Africa now to be controlled by the Germans. It seemed like everything that had gone wrong was going wrong. They had determined that if the baby that was to be born was born alive, they would call this baby, if it were a girl, Beulah Joy. But after reviewing the year, the death of their son, Paul Jr., the fever, the dysentery, the difficulty in pregnancy, the change in governments, the perilous political situation, when their little girl was born, they decided to describe her by that one thing which they still had left. They literally had everything stripped away from them, but they had one thing left, and that was their faith. So they called their little girl Faith. And if you remember, if you were here in June, my red-headed cousins, Faith and John, were here with me on this platform. That's the faith I'm talking about. Well, Paul recovered from his fever, but in spite of everything, the German occupation and what all, he was determined that he was going to go back to Togo, back to Topongo. And he knew that only God could make it possible because so many difficulties had occurred to them. So before he left to Ouagadougou to go back to Topongo, he knelt and he prayed this prayer, Oh God, give me strength one more time. As my cousin Johnny was sharing that day this whole story with me that was associated with this graveside visit, I thought I'll never let that prayer depart out of my life. Oh God, help me to never let go of it because there are times when each of us in life may feel absolutely pressed to the wall and yet God is summoning up us up to take another step and to get on with life and not get stuck and not become bitter. Oh God, give me strength one more time. The Weidmans went back to Topongo, established the church, and I've been there with my own eyes. I've met the present pastor in Topongo. I've met the pastor's father, an old gray-haired man, who when he found out that I was Paul's senior's nephew, his eyes lit up with joy because he knew Brother Paul, who is now with the Lord. The church in Togo today has 10,000 people. The church in Burkina Faso has 150,000. Both churches are growing incredibly. What good came out of that time? Where was the good and perfect gift? There were so many things that were dropping on their life that weren't good and perfect. But where was the good and perfect gift? In all the adversity of the dysentery, the death of their boy, 
the political reverses, the difficulty in pregnancies, all of those reverses were also in the midst of them, God was putting a good and a perfect gift of a little daughter, Faith. And he was dropping a great gift of faith into their own heart. And he was dropping stamina and strength into their life. And he was also birthing the church in Togo and Burkina Faso in their lives in those moments of time. When they weren't running off, he was giving them a special gift of strength to stick it out and get the job done in life and not run from responsibility. It was a good and perfect gift. And the church today is there as a result of their dedication and the other countless missionary families who, like the Weidmans in that area of the world, laid children and spouses in the grave for their commitment. Johnny was telling me that sometime after, several decades later, after this event of losing Paul Jr., in that area of northern Togo and southern Burkina Faso, there was a village that had not yet heard the gospel. And so one of the... Uh, missionaries that was then stationed there had decided to go out way out at this place was way out in the bush difficult to access went out there and wanted to tell them who Jesus Christ was they had never heard he thought in that village and uh, so and this is always the case in Africa when you're a stranger and show up man everybody turns out I mean crowds of 100,000 in Africa when you hear of that happening that's no surprise if you've been there you understand how it happens people are just ready to turn out and see what's going on it could be anything uh, if you show up and play a guitar, if you have a megaphone, if uh, you have a band, if you're a stranger and look different or whatever, anything that's interesting, you get a crowd. So the whole village gathered together for the missionary, and the missionary stood up and he said, uh, and, and by the way, how do you tell somebody about Jesus Christ who's never heard about him? That's challenging. He introduced it this way. I've come today, he said, to tell you about one who loves you so much that he gave his son for you. And an old white-haired black man in the crowd interrupted him and said, oh, we've heard about a man like that. He came here years ago and he gave his son for us because he loved us. And the old man wasn't talking, it turned out, about God. He knew nothing about Jesus Christ, but he'd heard about the white man, the missionary, who loved Africans so much that he gave his son to reach them. James says, he chose to give birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of cream of the crop of all these created. And my own family in that faraway place was being God's cream of the crop in a trial. And the end result was people were reached for the glory of God. We're always touching lives. Whatever our response to trial is, we're always touching people. We're touching our children. They're seeing how we're responding. They see whether we're flaking out or not. They see whether we're, whether we're being morally true or morally untrue, whether we're being spiritually true or not. Our family, our friends see it. We're influencing people. God says in your trial, I've got you as the cream of the crop, the best of the harvest, the first of the harvest, and I'm demonstrating my power in your life. So. Will you look around and see, I'm putting some good and perfect gifts there. I know there's a lot on the landscape of your life that isn't good and perfect, but I'm putting some things that are good and perfect. Maybe they're only in seed form, but they're there. Look at them. They're going to grow up, and they're going to produce life in you. Rule number three for trials, say better, better. We are on display as God's samples in the world. We are not running from pain and trial. We know that in everything it will be better. We are going to stand the test and receive the crown of life. Would you join me in prayer? Our Heavenly Father, very conscious of the fact that uh, there are maybe friends here today who are going through a particularly painful moment in their life, and your word now has come. Sometimes, Lord, our own internal life is like a dried-out, baked-up piece of ground that has sat under a hot sun for too long. And if a heavy rain comes down, it's going to all pour right on past us. So it doesn't get through to us. We're too dry. It just doesn't soak. It doesn't permeate. 
But Lord, I just sense in this context that we're here today. We've just slowly kind of opened your word. That your word comes by the ministry of the Holy Spirit as a gentle rain in our life giving us time to take it in, to let it perk down to the deeper inner levels of our life where the pain is the greatest. And you're dropping this little word, in fact, three little words into our hearts about our trial. Welcome, help, better. And you're ministering your healing to us. Thank you, Lord, that you've not let us or left us alone in trial, but that you're with us. And in this moment in our life, you are birthing the word of truth in us. And we're getting kind of set aside as the cream of the crop. Thank you for your help. Thank you for the good gifts. So easy, Lord, in the trial to chafe at all the restraints and the places that are rubbing us raw and proving difficult for us to cope with. Thank you for this moment of peace in you where we can thank you for the good you're doing, for the wonderful gifts that give us the strength to stand, persevere, and one day in your presence receive the crown of life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for comforting each of us for the ministry of your Holy Spirit that is so faithful to us. In your name, amen.